Thank you very much for inviting me up. Um, I'm Tom. I'm a say, medical oncologist um, from sunny Chelsea. Um, it's absolutely amazing to see how many people in the room. Um, I had no idea. I thought I might be speaking to three people. I have once given a meeting to one person. Um, <laughs> and this is absolutely incredible. Um, so it's, thank you for inviting me. Um, the, the debate thing, so there will be a bit of chat and I hope a bit of humour, that's not in any way to belittle what we're talking about or belittle anyone's situation. I will argue one point, Ali will argue the other. That is no way saying that a treatment that you or a family member may be on is wrong. Clearly there's no right or wrong answers, otherwise we wouldn't be debating this. So it's just the pointing out that there are different approaches to different things. So please don't look at this and say, oh my God, I can't believe I'm on this. Um, my, 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 um, my team aren't looking after me properly. That's not the way. So uh, this is, I, I'm going to argue for law latinib, not so much as your last TKI, but second line or later treatment. So you've had something else, and I reckon that law latinib is what you keep up your sleeve for later. These are my disclosures, and I want to point out I have been an advisory for drug companies involving all the drugs um, in uh, ALK, including law latinib, analectinib, and brigatinib. So I'm equally biased in every direction. I want, to be very, I want to be very open about that uh, disclosure. OK, why is this an important debate? Because it's an incredibly important debate, um, clearly, for everyone in the room here. But it goes a little bit, um, particularly for this, the uniqueness of ALK positive lung cancer. So this is the old way in which we used to do, if you don't mind me saying, normal lung cancer, other lung cancer, ALK wild type, not ALK. So we have some first-line treatments, which are my blue box here, and we would give those. And unfortunately, the second-line treatments, if you don't have ALK, don't work as long, and they don't work in as many people, which is why it's shorter and shallower. So what we spent a lot of time doing is trying to get our first-line treatments in people who don't have an ALK um, uh, fusion, the very best we can. We add in other drugs and immunotherapy and we've been talking about a minute ago to try to get this as long as possible. You basically put everything you can in the front because it's still very difficult to find good second line treatments. They do remain, unfortunately, not so good and are not so many people. But ALK's different. We know ALK's different. And ALK's different because you have this. And now I haven't got my formatting wrong. It's meant to fall off the other end of the slide. Because what we know in ALK is your first-line treatments work for much, 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 much longer. And the second-line treatments are much more effective. And the third-line treatments are much more effective. So what that means is you don't need to shove everything you possibly can do up front. What you really need to think about, and this is completely unique for lung oncologists, it's completely unique for us, is we've got to think ahead. We've got to think about the sequence we don't have to think about this, but when we first um, see someone in clinic, we need to think, what's my sequence going to be? What, what am I you might use as a second line treatment in, I hope, a few years' time? So that's why it's so important that maybe what we're doing is not just saying, I'm only going to think about my first line treatment. I'm actually thinking, more importantly, what's my second and my third, and I would hope later than that as well, treatment. So this is a picture of the way in which drugs have arrived in ALK. Um, here you have all the different um, age groups, all of them, but the main ones, I guess. And the round, red circle saying 2L is when it got licensed or approved for second line use, and the 1L when it got licensed or approved for first line. And you'll see that they all get approved for second line use first. And then the first line use is later, because that's the way clinical trials work. They all get tried in people with relapsed disease first, and then once you know they work, they move their way into first-line treatment. Various triangles are the approvals by uh, and, uh, CDF, which is in England, uh, SMC, which is Scotland. Um, and you can see that lags behind, but actually not bad um, for, for the UK. What you can really see is that these are drugs that came out first, and then seritinib, and then electinib, and then brigatinib, and lorlatinib brought up the tail. And so the way in which oncologists tend to do it is we tend to use the first drug we're exposed to. And so the reason um, that, for example, lorlatinib is largely used in the relapse setting, because it was the last one. It was the one that we, we came along last. We were already using these guys. 
And what we were saying is when these guys have stopped working, what can we use? Well, we were finding out that lorlatinib was something that had activity. So the evidence we have really for um, a drug after our best first line treatments, which are these two guys, is lorlatinib because that's the way it worked, because that was the last drug to come in and that's the ones we've been practicing with. That's the ones which the clinical trials have been looking at. So that's the kind of slightly weird way in which one drug might be seen as a later line treatment, whereas another drug might be seen as a first line treatment. And I think it's fair to say that the top two are probably older agents, which now are much less commonly used. So I think there are five reasons to, th to think about um, for Latin first or last. First of one is, is there cl a clearly superior first line treatment I should definitely go for? It's going to be better. Second one is, what are the second line options? I said to you why that's important, because we're thinking about serial treatments, multiple treatments over, I hope, a long time. We've got to think about side effects, we've got to think about quality of life, and we've got to think about convenience. So this is my only horrible slide, okay? Lots of things in it. And I went to look at the top, and I've written down the four drugs you can see. Seritinib, electinib, regatinib, lorlatinib, and the names of the trials. And here are the graphs showing how well they work. And in red is always crizotinib. They're comparing it to crizotinib. And in blue is always a new drug. Seritinib, electinib, brigatinib, lorlatinib. And you can see in all of those, the line is higher, because what that says is the drug is working for longer. It's controlling the cancer for longer. So in all of these, they are better than um, the old drugs like uh, crizotinib. I want you to now look at response rate, percentage of people in whom it works. Seritinib, 72% of a bit of an old-fashioned drug, but the ones I'm talking about, which I think should be the first line, electinib, 82%, just over, brigatinib, 71%, lorlatinib, 76%. It's very difficult to compare between trials. They're always different countries, different patient groups, different years. Basically, it's the same. Response rate is the same. And if we look at how long it works for, 25 months, 24 months. Now, we don't have the answer yet for lorlatinib because it's been going on, it's a later trial, it's been going on for longer, um, but broadly similar benefit. So I don't think there is one drug clearly superior to the other. I think these three guys are really good. I think seritinib has been superseded. But I think alectinib, brigatinib, lorlatinib, all very good drugs, all very active, and I think is broadly similar. You may say, well, hang on, you've talked about progression, free survival, how long it works for. What about, about how long overall survival is? We don't have the answer to that, which is why I put the exclamation marks up, because the average, the median, has not been reached yet, which is a good thing, because it's working for a long time. But we don't know that information yet. So I would say these three guys, all very good, and I don't think there's much to choose between them. But the second line option, as we know, is really important. Now, what's the best? Well, I would say lorlatinib is the strongest. This graph here, table, it's not a graph, is of the different drugs, crizotinib, seritinib, electinib, brigatinib, lorlatinib, against lots of new mutations which have developed when someone has been on, well, uh, resistance mutations in ALP. And you can see that red, yellow, and green. Red means that resistance is not sensitive to that drug. Yellow means it's not great, that drug. And green means the drug is active. And there's one agent which is active way more than the others. And the answer is lorlatinib. Now, this is done in, in, a, in a Petri dish. This is not done in patients, of course. Um, but that tells us this is an active drug against resistance mechanisms of uh, ALK. And what do I mean by resistance mechanisms? These are the things that appear and stop the first line ALK inhibitor working. Um, and as we've begun to use um, different drugs, we've learned these different resistant mutations appear. And whether you've been on crizotinib or seritinib or electinib, you get slightly different ones, and they've listed here. And all the ones here are the ones there. So what I'm saying is, if someone is on a first line treatment and develop an ALK resistance mechanism, the drug that's most effective is lorlatinib, the one in the green. So that's when you want to be using it. You don't want to be turning to your drug with has lots of yellow and red in there. That's not going to be really what you want. You want the one in the green. And in fact, we don't have a huge amount of data 
Um, but the biggest data we have for what do you use after a proper first line TKI? The answer to that is lorlatinib. And we've got data showing response rates, and we've got data showing how long they'll work for, and we've got waterfall plots of how much things improve. So although the data is small, the numbers are not massive. It's difficult to see it back on Excel standing there. Number 28 patients in this group, I, I absolutely agree. These are not huge studies. They're not randomized studies, which oncologists get very excited about. But the data we do have, and the evidence we do have, is with lorlatinib. And if you do pick up a mutation, that resistance mutation, you don't always find them, as I'm sure you know. But if you do find them, we know the lorlatinib works even better. It works for longer. In fact, if you do, it works for um, coming up to a year um, in terms of, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so a year, if you have an identifiable resistance mutation. So another reason, I think, to be, of course, we must be looking for those resistance mutations. Another reason why um, lorlatinib is beneficial. But what about side effects? This is really important. So I've written down the, the four drugs there, and I've written down the grade three, that's severe to life-threatening, largely severe, not life-threatening, side effects. And every drug has a slightly different one. This is liver toxicity, these numbers here. Um, but some others cause, for example, high blood pressure, um, anemia. Um, some of these have these two things, lipase and amylase, these are just blood tests we watch. And although they often go up, you actually don't do anything about it. We've learned to largely not worry about that too much. But there's one drug which does have a slightly different side effect profile, and that's lorlatinib. It doesn't say we shouldn't use it, but it does have a different side effect profile. And that includes some neurocognitive side effects, which I'm sure you'll all be aware of, mood disturbance, sleep disturbance, speech disturbance. It can also cause weight gain. And although... It's something one often has a wry smile about with, with, with my patients in clinic. Actually, it's not funny, actually, or gaining more in it. But how we look and how we feel is, is really important. And although oncologists really worry when people lose weight, actually, if someone's gaining weight, although you'd think that would be a great thing, it's not a great thing if you're gaining weight and you don't feel like you look like you want to be. Um, and so for that reason, it has a slightly more complicated side effect profile. It doesn't mean we shouldn't use it. But I would argue that these are side effects which are more challenging as a first-line treatment. Um, um, if you look at the people in the trial who stopped the tablet, the numbers remain small. Discontinuation rates remain small. But I think that's a slightly crude measure. Really, the measure you want to know is quality of life. How do people feel? Because stopping a treatment is a major thing. Stopping lorlatinib or electinib as your first-line treatment is a huge decision. So what about quality of life? Well, actually, if you compare, for example, brigatinib, with lorlatinib, what this is saying is that brigatinib, you have a better global quality of life here than with crizotinib. But if you look at lorlatinib, the global quality of life isn't significantly better than with crizotinib. So I would argue that although the treatment discontinuation rates in the trial when someone actually said, I can't take this drug anymore, is broadly the same, maybe even a bit better in lorlatinib. If you look at the real quality of life, what the patients are telling us, I think you see that lorlatinib is associated with uh, a less of an increase in quality of life. Finally, what do the regulatory bodies say? I apologise for, for um, people from Scotland that have not included the Scottish list here because I've struggled to find that information. Um, what it says, it's a little bit complicated, is as a first-line treatment, we can uh, give electinib and brigatinib um, and lorlatinib is not routinely funded. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll rephrase that. I'm so sorry. Um, the, that, that's that's a lot, uh, the uh, standard approval. In um, second line, that's the real key. The one which is actually funded and available in England is lorlatinib, because you can use lorlatinib after any of the drugs, whereas you can't use... For example, elect, you can't use, for example, electinib after lorlatinib. You're not going to get that funded by it. So actually, whether whatever we think, if you look at the funding situation of what's available in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, the answer is that you will have funding for these two guys as your first-line treatment, and there is funding for lorlatinib as a second-line treatment. And so because I don't think there's a massively superior 
one drug, which says I must use me. I think any of them are reasonable between electinib, brigatinib, and lorlatinib. Because of that, because I believe by far the best data for the second TKI is lorlatinib, because I think the side effects are easier for electinib and brigatinib, and because I think the quality of life is a bit easier, I personally use electinib or brigatinib as my first line treatment, and I keep lorlatinib in reserve for a second line treatment, and that's my argument for it. Thank you very much. I'm going to make the case for using lorlatinib up front. Um, I didn't hear Tom's case, but I'm sure it was excellent. Uh, those, are, those, those are my disclosures. Uh, I have talked for a number of companies. But the most important thing to take out of today is that uh, these slides, in my opinion, are for the purpose of debate and entertainment. Please do not necessarily regard them as clinical opinion or guidance. So I think very much the case for using lorlatinib up front is that you should be using your best treatment first. I suspect we saw this in Tom's talk anyway, but this was 2016. This was eight years ago where we were shown the in vitro data that we now see at pretty much every ALK talk and referenced in every manuscript showing that lorlatinib, at least in uh, um, test tubes, is the most potent against a number of ALK mutations. And at the same time, in that same paper, they showed that, and, and, and we know this now clinically, that um, when patients' cancers become resistant to the first and second generation ALK inhibitors, it is often uh, due to an acquisition of a further mutation in ALK, and a number of those can then be targeted by, by lorlatinib in the second and, and third line setting, in particular, you know, G1202R. But wouldn't it be better to stop these mutations forming in the first place? And if we did that, wouldn't that lead to a longer efficacy? So this is something you're not supposed to do, but everyone does at every single medical conference. So I'm going to do it today. And that's comparing, doing cross-trial comparisons. So here I've just got the data from the three clinical trials that have been performed looking at these drugs against prosotinib. And what we want to be doing is controlling our patient's cancer. That's the number one aim of treatment. And I think you can, just by looking at it, you can see that lorlatinib is visually superior at one, two, and three years in particular in the number of patients whose cancer is kept under control. Now, Tom will have come up with some rubbish about how you can rescue this with a second line treatment. And this was actually looked at in, in, in the Crown clinical trial. Admittedly, in Crown, they were comparing lorlatinib versus crizotinib, which we all would regard as an inferior ALK inhibitor. But they looked at the length of time, uh, they compared the length of time with lorlatinib against those patients who had crizotinib and then went on to subsequent treatments. And I think what you can show is, see is that lorlatinib gives you uh, far long uh, uh, periods of control in your first two lines of treatment. So by using your best treatment up front, you don't need a good second line treatment. The next uh, thread to my argument is the importance of the brain. And we all know that unfortunately, alkaline cancer is, uh, can commonly escape to the brain. And that is a common mechanism of resistance to certainly the first and second generation ALK inhibitors. I think everyone in the room will be aware of the problems that this causes in terms of symptoms, the effect on patients' quality of life. Unfortunately, I know you guys are working on it and I, I shout at them all the time, the DVLA guidance on driving is still Victorian. There is the psychological impact of, of, of knowing that you have brain metastasis. And also, if we do start to have disease occurring in the brain, then we need to start looking at other therapies, directed therapies such as surgery and radiotherapy. Patients who have brain metastasis may also uh, respond less well to subsequent other treatments apart from ALK inhibitors such as chemotherapies and immunotherapies. And as an active clinical trialist, patients who have active brain disease are often excluded from clinical trials for better or worse. So all of these highlight that we need to keep control of the brain for as long as possible. You may have seen this data that came again out of the Crown study, which looks at the time that patients had their brain disease controlled. So on the left, you have those patients, so A, those patients who, who had brain disease when they went onto the study, and you can see that lorlatinib was much better at keeping it under control. So every time the red line goes up on the crizotinib, it's the patient losing control in their brain, unfortunately, and, and the blue line is on lorlatinib. 
But most importantly to me is the graph on the right. So those are patients who did not have brain metastasis when they went into this study. And you can see over, over about just over a year, about a fifth of them on crozotinib did develop brain metastasis. But I think there was only one patient on lolatinib who developed a brain, a brain metastasis in this time. So lolatinib is very good at keeping brain disease under control. The third thread to my argument is that by using lolatinib, we know that there's variations in national practice in terms of brain imaging, brain surveillance, and also how good the consultants are at switching one patient from an ALK inhibitor to another. So if we just keep it simple for everyone, for all the oncologists out there, we just say, you just you need to use lolatinib for as long as it works and it'll keep the brain under control. You need to image the brain at the baseline, but maybe the surveillance is not quite so important in that situation because we were using such a brain effective treatment. So I think lolatinib could help reduce some of the variation that we see in, oncolo in oncological treatment. Lastly, I know that uh, Dr. Newsom Davis, Davis will have touched on the side effects of lolatinib. And in particular, I think both clinicians and patients may be concerned when they read the leaflet about the impact of uh, um, side effects affecting the brain, such as, as mood and neuropathy. So this is a, uh, uh, I've made these pie charts myself from the Crown paper, looking at the instance of adverse events. So that's just anything that happens to a patient within the brain or the central nervous system. So it doesn't necessarily even need to be related to the drug. Okay, if you had a headache that wasn't related to the drug, that would be captured within this pie chart. And about a third of patients had something like that within a clinical trial. And then if you look on the right, actually over half of them didn't need anything done about it. Another quarter were just managed with conservative management, so that's the next orange and gray thing. And the orange means that they got better. So five out of, five out of the 11 got better, six didn't get better with conservative management. And only about a quarter of those patients needed dose reductions. And in the vast majority of those, again, you can see the orange that with the number 15 next to it, the vast majority, they got better. So side effects are manageable um, if, you've, if you follow appropriate guidelines. So to conclude my argument, uh, I, I, I'm sure I've demonstrated better than Tom did that the Latin is better for the key outcomes in terms of controlling the disease for as long as possible and keeping brain control, which is crucial in this disease. Side effects can be managed with appropriate management. And I think if we use lolatinib up front, it will reduce some of the national variation in clinical practice we see. Thank you very much. I didn't get any applause. There you are. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, right. I think what we'll do is we'll take questions from the floor and then we'll go for a vote. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's only right, don't you, in a debate? So does anyone have any questions for either uh, Dr. Tom or Dr. Alistair? There must be some. There's one here. I'm just wondering what sort of resistance people get after lorlatinib. We're all sort of familiar with the green and the orange and the yellow from the prior drugs. But what happens after lolatinib? Are, they, are the mutations completely different or what are you seeing? Ali, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, I, I, so I, I don't think we know for definite. You do start to see abnormalities in other genes, some of which can't be targeted particularly easily. So, so, so certainly KRAS abnormalities have been shown in a number of patients. Um, you can also occasionally see histological transformation, to, so to to other types of cancer as we see with EGFR mutant lung cancer. So I think Sanjay's had a patient who's transformed to small cell that they reported on. And certainly we've seen that as well. Um, but a variety of different mechanisms, but not so many within ALK because I think you're hitting ALK so far. Uh, and, and anything to add to that, Tom, or not? No, I agree. I, I think we know less about it, um, partly because yeah. fewer people have been on it. And they perhaps a bit more diverse. In other words, it's different types of ways of happening. Um, that doesn't mean we won't have ways of tackling that, but I think we're not. We don't know enough about it yet. Thanks. Thanks for two excellent presentations and very entertaining. Um, uh, is there any data at all about 
the either progression free or overall survival according to the sequencing that you do it? Or is it just too early to have that because the data isn't available? The only one I can really see of quality and which is beyond just anecdote is the one I showed with the table with about 28 patients in that group. And that included people who had had a second generation or later, which basically means electinib or brigatinib, um, and then went on to have lorlatinib. And the overall response rate was around 45%. Um, and the progression free survival median was 5.5%. If you break that down into people who have an identifiable mutation, that, in other words, you can find a resistance mutation, that progression free survival goes up to 11 months. It's very small numbers. 28 is, is tiny in terms of trying to draw conclusions. And that's really the most I can see. In terms of looking at using other TKAs after lorlatinib, I think it is largely anecdotal, unless, unless you know anything I don't know, Ali. But I think that just reflects that, that lorlatinib's come on the scene so much later. Yeah, um, you know, in Crown, when patients did progress on lorlatinib, quite a lot of them did receive subsequent ALK inhibitors, which wouldn't be the case in the UK environment. Um, but we don't really know what the efficacy is. I suspect it's relatively limited going back. You know, patients were receiving electinib and brigatinib after lorlatinib, mm. things like that. And I think the efficacy is going to be limited. Um, the other thing, just in terms of the sequencing, which we don't really do in the UK at the moment, but hopefully will come forward, is that we do know that the original fusion that is in the cancer may predict for um, uh, progression-free and, and overall survival. Um, I think that's quite getting quite well established now. And hopefully in the UK, we're moving towards sequencing patients at baseline. Um, also the instance of co-mutations such as in genes uh, like P53, um, where you get extra mutations in the cancer, that may also mean that patients do, do, do less well. So, going forward, we may have more information about patients' cancer in the future. And if we think that they may have a, a cancer that's got less good genomics, these may be the patients who we might want to use a little latinib up front. Well, in, in patients that have better genomics or cancers have better genomics, we, we might be happy on using the, the uh, lesser um, ALK inhibitors that Tom's trying to sell you. The, um, I'd, I'd agree with the former point, not the last point. Um, <laughs> the, the understanding of mutation is really key, and there is a, uh, a study, a pilot going ahead uh, nationwide looking at liquid biopsies at the time of diagnosis. This is NIHR, National Institute of Health Research, backed to see, it's a bit of a no-brainer, um, is it quicker and is it better than a tissue biopsy? Well, of course, it's going to be quicker. And if we're able to get the situation where the NHS funds upfront liquid biopsies, we all know more about an ALK fusion at the time of diagnosis. I absolutely agree with Ali. Then I think we're in a situation where we might be able to make an even more intelligent assessment to say, this is a ALK fusion which might do better with drug A as opposed to drug B. And that would be a lovely situation to be in. So, um... I thought the arguments are so great on both sides. I'm going to ask my oncologist to prescribe me both. <laughs> uh, no, but serious, my, my, a more a proper serious question. Um, we've obviously now looking at a, a new generation of TKIs coming down the line and going into early trials. Are we looking at a law of diminishing return with TKIs now? And is, is it, are we really now looking for what the next novel treatment's going to be? So I, I think what we come across is going to be a, uh, a, co a conflict of interest between what the pharmaceutical company wants and what we want. What a pharmaceutical company wants is their drug as a first-line treatment. That's where the money is. Um, what we want is sequential, really good drugs. So you go on drug A, and when that stops running, you've got drug B and hopefully drug C, and we hope as many as possible. Um, the commercial interest for some pharmaceutical companies is to bring it up the pecking line. I think it probably would be a law of diminishing returns in terms of first-line treatments. I think we have got three very good treatments. What I think, if someone said to me, where's the, where's the, where's the missing bit is, I want to have lots of TKIs I can use sequentially. Um, and to me, that's the real value of another, another drug coming in. Compared to other agents, these drugs work in so many people and can work for so long. 
um, as that first treatment. I think it's subsequent treatments which are key. Would you reckon, Annie? Yeah, I, I sort of agree with you. I think the one thing where we, we may be able to, to improve, I'd hope we'd be able to improve, is, um, you know, I, I think lorlatinib is very effective, but there are issues in some of its side effects. And a lot of those are probably due to its penetration in the brain and actually on target. So hit, knocking out down in the brain, um, things like the weight gain and, and, and the mood disturbance. And so, so we may not be able to get rid of those completely, but I think it would be nice to see if we can get those a bit better, not only to give a therapy that everyone will be happy to use in the first line setting, but also if in the future we're going to start to combine with other tablets, you need, you need the drug that's really well tolerated in the first instance, if you're going to think about adding in extra tablets to it. The, the last thing to say is there's also a slight complexity when you try to trial that new drug as a first line treatment. What do you compare it to? what standard therapy yeah. um, and that's quite a complicated one so it not only needs to be what would the oncologist use but also from a reimbursement point of view whether it's the FDA or Europe or UK it needs to be compared to what's routinely available can I ask a question I would guess at the moment with electinib and migratinib as the, as the options for first line treatment, that patients are not greatly involved in that decision, um, that it's generally the oncologist will make that decision. When lorlatinib becomes first line choice, which it almost certainly will, probably will anyway, is there a role for patients to be involved in that choice and, and how would they be involved? I, I think should always be involved and I should be involved before lorlatinib becomes available. So I would always Go through. I don't mention crizotinib, I don't mention ceritinib, I don't think they're relevant. I definitely have a discussion about the A and the B, which to me is electinib and brigatinib. Um, and I think if we don't do that, then we're not doing our job properly. Um, and actually the great majority um, of patients with an out positive lung cancer would, would come in knowing that because you're a very different patient group and know, know that stuff. And I think that's the best, that's the that's the most interesting part of, of, of a, of a doctor-patient interaction is when someone's saying, well, this is, this is what I know is available. What, what do you think? And you have a discussion about the pros and cons because it's not me taking the drug. I'm prescribing it. I'm not taking it. So that discussion should have na happen now. And it'll be even more involved when we have a third agent available. So, uh, Tom, I think I think you're a bit in your ivory tower here. Um, you know, I, I, I think um, particularly when patients first present and we're starting on, on the tablet, so much has happened to them so quickly. Many of them have not yet had involvement with UK ALK or had a chance to look on the internet, and many of them will just be told, you know, this is the ALK inhibitor we use. Here you go, and not have that have that discussion about about choices. And I think it's it's difficult for you as a patient group to reach the, the patients early on. Um, you know, I know Deborah and the rest of the team have been talking to the lung specialist nurses and they're probably the people that can help you um, uh, get to patients when, when they may need support early on. And equally, um, they may be the ones who are saying, well, actually, there's more than one ALK inhibitor out there. Because as you say, oncologists, not all oncologists, but some oncologists just give out the one that they, they want to or the one they feel most comfortable with, particularly if they only see one or two outpatients a year. And I think that that's a real challenge, you're absolutely right, which is doctors are creatures of habit. And if you don't see it very often, you'll reach for the same one. And I think that may, may be the perfect choice, but I, but I think you're right. We, 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 you know, that's something we try to do through British Thoracic Oncology Group, BTOL. We, we, we're trying to educate all of our allied health professionals, nurses, doctors, everyone, to say, um, how do we best empower our patients to make, um, make a choice about things? But also, how do we tell our colleagues there is more than one drug available. Make sure you stay up to date. And keeping you guys up to date is, seems to me that the first step in doing that. It's Mary up by Andy. Right. After Andy, we will go to the vote. I'm very intrigued. There's a pair of shoes under here. Oh, right, you've got two. Very, very organised. You I both, thought you got rid of someone. You both presented very good arguments and I'm struggling to differentiate. Um, is cost a factor that oncologists have to consider? Honest truth is, certainly I can speak for England hospitals, but no, because there is a cost difference. 
but actually for my department, for my hospital, it doesn't make any difference. So that cost difference is borne at a national level. Um, now, that might seem a bit of a stupid argument because you could say, well, there is a cost because we all pay into the NHS. Ultimately, it doesn't matter whether you have a North American private healthcare system or a UK socialised healthcare. Ultimately, we all pay for healthcare one way or another. So um, there, there, there is a cost implication, although it's not, to my understanding, huge. Um, but I don't think when I make that decision between, for example, lectin progastinib or lorlatinib, the one thing I'm not thinking about, interestingly, is cost. Ali, do you, do you see it differently? Uh, for once, I agree with you. <laughs> I, uh, I did notice that one of Alice's slides showed um, MRI scan every three months, and then it disappeared from the screen. And I was just thinking, you know, what the impact of that might be, given that some of us are having trouble getting an MRI scan done on a, a, you know, a reasonably regular basis. Or is it, is, would an MRI scan just be for people who are known to have uh, brain mets, really? I, I think most of us would say that regular MRI scans um, in a patient without positive lung cancer is an important part of what we do. There is a great variation in accessibility of that. And there's also great variation, as Ali pointed out so clearly, Ali, um, in, in uh, how up-to-date our colleagues are in doing that. I personally do do them every three to six months, depending a little bit on where you are. Um, it's, uh, I don't want to bring politics into it, but in, in a week where we've just had a cut to the National Insurance Rise for health, health, health and Social Welfare, you worry where the money's going to come from to allow more MRI scanners. And that's a real concern. I think Ali's point about the variation in treatment is, is really key. And it is a little bit about money, but it's about us educating our colleagues to say, this is how you should do it. Ali, what, what, what do you reckon? Yeah, no, no, I, 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 again, I agree with you. You know, we've got one eighth the number of MRI scanners that Japan does. At the moment, I'm waking, waiting about six weeks for an MRI result. You know, um, trying to get free monthly MRIs is going to be challenging. Yeah, should be better. Yeah, we should be. So, lady at the back. <laughs> um, I um, am in the unusual position, I think, of uh, having declined MRIs when they've been offered to me um, because I don't really want to know whether I've got brain metastases and I don't want to lose my driving license because at the moment my lung cancer doesn't have an impact on my children's lives and if I lose my <laughs> driving license it will. Although I'm also worried about air pollution and the fact that <laughs> I'm driving them around doesn't help the next generation of potential lung cancer patients. Um, I wouldn't have asked this, but I wonder, because we came onto it, do you think I'm stupid for declining a brain MRI? <laughs> and you're not that unusual. Okay. Um, lots of people yeah. say thanks, but no thanks. I think, and it's, it's something we should have touched on. And we talk about it quite a lot in our educational yeah. meetings. Lots of people will say, I don't want to know. And I, I, I think it's very reasonable. I'm not I'd want to know. Okay, thank you. Ali, what, what do you reckon? Yeah, no, 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 I completely, you know, I, I agree. In a, I, I work in an area where there's extremely limited public transport, you know, uh, and, and it's a disaster if people lose their driving license, particularly if, as you say, they're young and got a young family. It's caused major, major headaches, and the DVLA must be so fed up with me writing rude letters to them. I suspect they just don't open them anymore. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, now we come on to the exciting bit. So, people who vote for me get free biscuits <laughs> <laughs> and a beer. If you don't vote for me, you don't. <laughs> no one can abstain. You have to vote one way or the other. Okay, so all those who believe that lolatinib should be reserved in the second line setting, please raise your hands. <laughs> Alistair, I'll go through the second question, but <laughs> I think I might be wasting my time. Right, all those who believe that lolatinib should be used first line. Uh, 
as uh, there's less than 10 in the room <laughs> and there's oh, 110 no. in the audience. <laughs> Performance uh, I, I guess that probably counts as a loss, doesn't it? Okay. Yeah, I think I'll, it I'll does, yes. <laughs> but but I, I, I think, again, serious point is if you are wrong first angle Latin, it, if a friend, a colleague is, it doesn't mean it's a wrong treatment. It's still a very good treatment. The, you know, these, are, these are semantics we're discussing. and we, we have the luxury of having at least three very, very good drugs. So, so please don't think that you're on the wrong drug because you're not. No, absolutely not. Yes. Yeah, and I think it is for everybody here. Yeah, exactly. You want that safety net behind you. 